That was a great story, wasn't it? And thank you. The text was awesome as well, uh, because this is what we're doing this month. So if you skipped last week, I forgive you. It's okay. We had the same text. So if you want to dwell with us this month in the text that we are, we're doing the Beatitudes. We're, we're dealing with the Beatitudes, and I want to thank uh, all those who have participated, the music, the story. Oh my goodness. Do you want to go on a journey to see God? I think I want to, and, and thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the invitation. That is uh, what I do, and thank you for recognizing the fact that I get to be a teacher. I was the teacher of the Sabbath school class this morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Heinrich, for filling in for me before because I was late. Uh, I, uh, I ask your forgiveness for that. But uh, the fact is, that's why we gather together on a Sabbath morning is to encourage each other in this journey that we are taking. And here we are in Santa Clarita. You could have been any number of other places this morning, even in Adventist churches. I, I want to encourage you. I know some of you know that there is another Adventist church in Santa Clarita. They speak the language of heaven there. Espanol. Okay? Or if you're from Spain, es, Espanol. Okay, isn't that right? Eth, eth, espanol? Okay, all right. So just checking. How do you say Eth, eth, espanol? Okay. <laughs> I've heard that the cath, Castellanos say cath, cath. Anyway, I'm not a Spanish, a proper Spanish speaker. I, I took French in school, so je parle français a little bit. Thank you for being here, and uh, your Bibles will be uh, useful to you if you want to turn to the book of Colossians, that will be where we're coming out of. But first of all, I have the honor of reminding us of Numbers 3 and 4. We have the, the Beatitudes, and, 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 and last week it was, Blessed are the... What's number one? What does it say? I won't even turn to it. The poor in spirit... And we reminded ourselves that being poor in spirit means literally that you are, you are not drawing your own desire to take care of yourself, but that you are realizing your need of being cared for and or motivated by the Spirit of God. And then the second was, blessed are those who mourn. Okay, And we learned that this is not, in some respects, mourning for someone that you have lost like we do at a funeral, but this is mourning for the fact that what breaks God's heart about what's going on in our world today also breaks your heart. And what, uh, what, what uh, the condition that you find the world in today is something that you are not satisfied with. Okay? Uh, we, we have the opportunity, I think, every day on the news these days to realize that how things are going even in this wonderful country of the United States of America we have the opportunity to say things are not necessarily as God would like them to be okay we by sitting here today you are saying I'm the kind of person who wants to follow God and, and, and as Adventists, we would say, you're the kind of person who also wants to come on Saturday to follow God. And we're saying, wow, that's, that's, that's like even a, another step beyond uh, the people who will sit in these very same pews tomorrow morning about this time. We rent to a church that uh, is Christ Church, and, and they fill this, this church as much or more than we do on a Sunday. And they are worshiping the same God, and they are wishing many of the same things for their community just as we are. I know because I've talked to their pastor that he has a heart for this community and he is also trying to encourage, as I am trying to encourage you, he is encouraging his people to be involved in this community to try and change those things which cause us to mourn. Okay? So today we have number three. Blessed are the meek. Okay, this is not a word that we, 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 we tend to use that, that much, do we? Uh, blessed, I, I, I would love to be meek, right? Do, do we say that very much? I, I don't think so. So we do have another word that I think we 
generally would like to be thought of as being. So I'm going to introduce the word gentle. Okay? Um, and even putting uh, it in another way, which is a similar word, genteel. That goes back to English history, where you have people who were part of the gentry, as it were, as opposed to being part of the low lives. Well, everybody doesn't. No, nobody wants to be thought of as a low life. We talked about that in Sabbath school today. Why is it that in our economy today, we pay millions of dollars to neurosurgeons, but we don't pay millions of dollars to those who pick up our garbage? When I lived in England for five days, the dustbin men went on strike in London. Five days. And the government buckled because the trash just piled up in some places 20 feet high in five days. Yeah, you don't want to pay attention to the dustbin man? Just let him not pick up your garbage for several days in a big city like London, and you'll find out just how important the garbage disposal people are. But yet, we don't seem to think that that's important. We don't seem to think that that's worth paying millions of dollars for. So, no, they get good pay, but they don't get the pay that a neurosurgeon does. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the gentle. And, the, and number four, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. These two we put together in the following manner. It is talking about the salvation and it is talking about the people that God is interested in saving and what he is wanting us to be in the meantime before he comes back. So I could say, if we use a big word in, in church, we call it sanctification. Anyone heard that big word? We hardly even know what it means. Okay, so I'm going to use another word, salvation. We, I think we know that, and I think we know that we all need saving. Salvation is participation in the life that Jesus is now living here on earth. And you say, Pastor, but I, I, I thought Jesus was in heaven. Yes, he is. We are told by Scripture that he is at the right hand of the Father. But by the power of God, in whatever fashion he determines that it should happen, Jesus said, I don't leave you alone. I send my comforter. I send my spirit to be with you. Jesus said, my spirit. So the way in which Jesus is here now with us is through his spirit. And the neat thing about that is he can be with you and you and you and you and me at the same time. In fact, he is available to the entire world. Seven point something billion people on planet Earth today have access to the Spirit of God. When Jesus was in Palestine, he could only be in one place at one time. And he did what he did by order of his Father in heaven. Remember, he said, I do nothing. I say nothing except that my father tells me to do or say it. Now he's doing the same thing, or he is the same thing, only in his place as the commander of the heavenly hosts, in his place now as the king of the world, having fully bought it back with his blood. He is with us in spirit. So let me say it again. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Another way of saying that might be that salvation or the situation in which we find ourselves where humanity is being saved. We're in the process of, of this pre-time before Jesus comes back, which I personally have called, what? The first episode of our eternal life. No? Okay, so... Salvation, we're in that saving relationship with Jesus Christ, which some of us call sanctification, we could say is participation in the life that Jesus is now living here on earth. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says 
that we are raised in, raised up with Christ, seeking. Here's now comes, here comes an attitudinal, an attitudinal statement. This is now going to be the attitude. Remember, the Bible says we should have the mind of Christ, we should have the attitude of Christ. Here comes a statement from Paul that backs that up. Seeking the things above. If you're part, if you're living the life that Christ is now living in the world, if that is what you're wanting to participate, if you're being meek, if you're being gentle and you're following Jesus in his gentleness, if you are following after him, if you're thirsting, hungering for being part of that group, You will seek the things above where Christ, our leader, is seated at the right hand of the Father. Verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on the things that are on this earth. We kind of got into it in Sabbath school this morning, but I'll say it it, it bears saying again. Um, Folks, I I try this, and and I know that I struggle with it, and so I know that you struggle with it because we're all human. Um, The gathering of things to ourselves is done so so that we can take care of ourselves and we judge ourselves as to how well we've done that, right? Oh, I can take care of myself. I've got this car. Or I can take care of myself. I've got this house. Or or I wear these kinds of clothing. And I point to the person over there and say, oh, they're walking beside the road with a suitcase and some raggedy clothes because they can't take care of themselves. They are homeless. Hmm. Hmm. What if we had to say to ourselves, because we have set our mind on things above, because we have Christ as our leader, and we know him to be an exceptionally, and a supernaturally generous person, we reminded ourselves today in Sabbath school of the fact that he kept the Israelites in food and clothing and shelter for 40 years. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. Miraculous. Yes. Our God can do that. Believe it. If you don't, then basically you're saying, I I don't really need. I don't really need that. But if you come to that place, uh, as I struggle to be in that place too, because... I have this need to acquire. <laughs> oh, those shoes. Man, got, got to have. Okay, so just that whole attitude of acquire. And then you say to yourself, well, why? Why do I need that? And you realize, no, I don't need that. God has provided what I need. I don't need that in addition. So then you say, well, but I have the money for it. I can do it. And I, then you start saying, well, Maybe it's because if God is my leader and I'm going to be doing what he is wanting me to do, I'm setting my mind on things that are above, then he leads me in different ways. I am going to be living a different kind of life. In fact, as this statement that I started with goes, we will be living the life that Christ is now living on this earth. Because we are, as the text will say in a moment, hidden in Christ. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. Um, and here, here we go, verse 3. You, <laughs> and in that one tiny little three-letter word, is, is encapsulated the idea of you and all your ideas of taking care of yourself and leading your own life. Is that too harsh? I don't think so, because I I first have to say it to myself. You have died. I took the opportunity to to watch the new movie about Winston Churchill this week. Tough, tough. When you have a group of individuals who think that their idea of how they could deal with Mr. Hitler was better than Winston Churchill's idea, and they undermined him and tried to get rid of him, I say, thank God, 
that God's, God's way of dealing with that situation, especially when over 300,000 men were on the, on the shores of Dunkirk waiting to be evacuated, and there were literally hours, hours to do it, that he gave Churchill the idea to ask his, his head of the, uh, the, the, the fleet to say, look, can you get anybody with a boat that's 30 feet or bigger to go over to Dunkirk and get our guys? We just do not have the ships to evacuate 300,000 guys off the, off the, the, the beaches of Dunkirk. But that idea was, was, uh, was undermined by other people who did not believe in the way forward. That happens again and again and again because of our idea that we have the knowledge to know how to go forward. Here in Colossians, the Apostle Paul, a big-time rabbi who knows the Bible and knows God, says that he's an apostle because he's seen Jesus, tells us, you and your ideas of how to go forward, dead. Dead. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let me just unpack that in one small way for you. Where did I say that Jesus is standing right now? Where do we believe? And where does Scripture say in Colossians that Jesus is standing right now? He is at the right hand. Well, okay, so you're right. He is at the right hand of the Father right now. So what is this next text saying? Where are you if you accept Jesus and if you're part of his kingdom? Where are you standing? Right there. So if you don't believe that you are part of the kingdom of heaven, then you are missing out on standing with Jesus in the presence of holy God. And in fact, that is the only way in which you are able to stand. He says, because if you do it by yourself, you deserve death. It's not going to work. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who really, really want to be part of the kingdom of God. God says that's, that's the way forward. It, it, you, you've got to really hun hunger and thirst after righteousness. Verse 4 of Colossians chapter 3. When Christ, who is our life. Want to know the way forward? Do what Jesus did. Follow Jesus. Be a disciple of Jesus. That's how he wants us to live. He wants us to live the life that Christ is now living in the world today. I've said this to you before. I'll say it again. When Jesus was 12 years old in the temple, what did he say to his mama? When his mama came to him and scolded him for not going home with them after Passover, what did he say? Don't you want me to be about my father's business? And he wasn't being, he wasn't being cheeky. Okay, I said that kind of cheeky. Okay, so he probably was very humble. And he said, Mom, you know, don't, don't you want me to be doing dad's business? And she knew who his father was. And it's not Joseph. It's his heavenly father. And so I say to you then, now, as I've said before, do you think that he is not about his father's business now? What is the father's business? John 3.16. Come on, folks. There is not a single human being that draws breath on planet Earth right now that our heavenly father is not interested in coming home to live with him. And yes, that means ISIS. Yes, that means those who worship the trees in Papua New Guinea. Every single person who draws breath on planet Earth, the Heavenly Father is interested in having that child know about him and come home with him. When Jesus comes again, he wants them to be ready. He wants them to be interested. He wants them to be hungering and thirsting after that relationship. Okay? 
So then the call to us who have already accepted that, uh, that relationship is to live the life that Jesus is living in the world today. Simply put, to do as Jesus is doing, and as we say and sing, to be the hands and feet, the human face of Christ in people's lives. I've said to you before that Jesus is the plan. I will say this today. God's plan is to provide a way by which those who want to find God can do so. The word became flesh, says John, so that we could touch, we could hear, we could see God. God incarnated so that we could understand as best as he, the great God of the universe, could do. Jeremiah says, you will seek me when you seek me with all your heart. My friends, we are needing very much to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Hungering and thirsting for that close, intimate relationship. Now, many of us are interested in, in, in how we will know that we are Christians. Okay? So let's go with that song in closing. They will, we, we will know. We will know. And they will know that we are Christians, that we are hungering and thirsting after righteousness because we act in love. Love is the operating system that will characterize our interaction with our world. Jesus is. God is love. Again, the statement that we started with. Let us join with Jesus in doing the ministry that he is doing in the world right now. Okay? Many people say, oh, let's hurry up and finish the work so that Jesus can come back like he's really waiting for us. I've got news for you. According to my reading of Scripture, Jesus isn't waiting for us. The only thing he's waiting for us to do is to join him in what he is already doing. And the fact is that he's going to do it with or without us. So that boils it down a lot uh, simply, a lot more simply for me. Uh, the question today to all of us is, would you like, would you like an opportunity to walk beside Jesus and watch him do his work in other people's lives as a result maybe of some of the things that you say, as a result maybe of some of the things that you do, you will watch as he takes those tiny little actions, a smile, and multiplies them like loaves and fishes in someone's life where they were thinking of committing suicide and because you smiled at them, because you took the time to look them in the eye as a, as a loving human being, representing the God of heaven, that they decided that their life was worthwhile. That's, that's what I'm saying. These are tiny little things that we do because it's all about him. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about what he is doing in the world today. And the question is, do we want to be with him while he does it? Then I believe we will be able to say, we are part of those who are living the gentle life the gentle life of Jesus. And secondly, we are those who are hungering and thirsting for the opportunity to be part of the righteous kingdom. May God bless you this week as you seek righteousness, as you look for opportunities to be in his kingdom and to walk beside him as he is doing his ministry in people's lives. Amen. Amen.